Good morning, everybody. It's really great to see you. It's always spring when the NHBSR conference comes around. I want to take this opportunity to really thank Michelle for her years of leadership here at NHBSR and turning it into or, or leading the organization into what it is today. I also want to thank Zena, the conference committee, and the NHBSR board, and their entire team. You folks always put together a really epic program that touches all the bases, and this year is no different. And more than that, you have an organization that brings such tremendous value to the New Hampshire and the New England business community with the programming, the events, the tools, and the support that you offer throughout the year. So it's my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce Professor Rebecca Henderson as NHBSR's keynote speaker for this year's conference. She holds the John and Natty MacArthur University Professor Chair at the Harvard Business School and is a visionary leader and renowned author driving change in the world of business. With over three decades of expertise in organizational and strategic change, she's a trailblazer in advocating for purpose-driven capitalism and the role that business leaders at every level can play in reimagining our current system. She's a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow of both the British Academy and of the, and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research at the Harvard Business School includes looking at why purpose or mission-driven firms might be significantly more productive and creative, and she's promised in an exchange earlier that her, her latest research is going in some really interesting directions. I can't wait to see where that goes. She sits on the boards of IDEX and Ceres, and her 2020 book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, this book that we have here in front of us, was shortlisted for the Financial Times McKinsey 2020 Business Book of the Year. We're so fortunate to have her here today. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca Henderson to NHBSR. Thank you. Good morning. Matt, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the work you do. Matt gave me a lovely introduction, but he didn't mention perhaps the most important thing, which is that I am a New Hampshire resident. Um, <laughs> My husband, uh, Jim Marone, has been a resident of New Hampshire for more than 20 years. And in COVID, we moved to our uh, New Hampshire house for the real thing. So we spend uh, nine months of the year in New Hampshire and three months in Cambridge. Um, and I'm proud to be a resident of New Hampshire. The, uh, the other thing that you may not know is my husband, Jim Marone, is Joe Marone's brother. Some of you may know Joe Marone. He was CEO of Albany International um, and was then chair of the New, New Hampshire um, college system for a while. Wonderful man, lives in Portsmouth. And uh, when he heard I was going to do this, he said, say hi to Doug. So Doug, hi. <laughs> but this is just to say that both my husband and I care deeply about the welfare and fate of New Hampshire. So it was exciting to listen to Sally and Doug, and Lisa, and so many people in the corridors talking about this wonderful state and how to make it even better. So I'm going to go up to the global level. I'm going to talk about finding hope in a world on fire because, I don't know about you, but it feels to me as if we're in kind of a tough moment. I'm going to focus on climate change, not because it's the only problem or the most important problem. Equity, inequality, justice are incredibly important issues. But I'm going to focus on climate change because it's real and it's coming and it's going to have a multiplicative effect on all the bad stuff. It's an accelerant of inequality. It's an accelerant of injustice because of the way it's coming and what it's going to do. So for those of you who are going to leap to your feet and run out before the end of the presentation, here's the bottom line. We're in a really tough time. We are not going to fix it. We are not going to build utopia. It's too late to prevent major damage and a lot of suffering. But that does not mean we cannot do amazing work. 
we can build a better world, a more connected, a more joyful, a more just world. But it's going to be hard. And we're going to need to find our sources of strength and hope as we do that. So I'm going to open rather unusually. I've never opened a keynote presentation to 200 people with a poem before, but this is my first time. So this is by Brad Aaron Modlin, and the poem is What You Missed That Day You Were Absent From Fourth Grade. Mrs. Nelson explained how to stand still and listen to the wind, how to find meaning in pumping gas, how peeling potatoes can be a form of prayer. She took questions on how not to feel lost in the dark. After lunch, she distributed worksheets that covered ways to, remembered your, to remember your grandfather's voice. Then the class discussed falling asleep without feeling you had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the psalms during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm for sound when your own thoughts are all you hear. Also, that you have enough. The English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy, the one that proves that hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost and one person add up to something. I love this poem because it reminds us that underneath our skills and our CV and our savoir-faire, there's a small child who wonders if the house they wake up in is their home. And that is true for everyone. And I start here because three years ago, I had a bad moment. I was riding high. I had published Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, and it had been, in our small world, a smash hit success. Translated into seven languages, and it came out in April 2020. You remember April 2020? <laughs> I thought the book would disappear without a trace. But it turned out that people were keen to talk about a world on fire and that everyone wanted to be on Zoom. I did a couple of Zoom seminars with more than 15,000 people on the Zoom. I talked to thousands of people all over the world. For a year, I was doing three or four Zoom calls a day in the Far East, in South America, in Europe, and in the US. Since I was also running <laughs> the required course in leadership at HBS with a thousand students and a teaching team of 10, I got a tiny bit stressed. And more importantly, I came to believe that the official future it's going to be okay, we're going to fix it, we just need the right policies and to push a little harder and we're going to fix it, was not going to work. That we needed another way in. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the fact that the technology and the policy is absolutely critical. I believe every word I wrote in my book, which I hope you enjoy if you happen to pick it up. You should know that you'll get the whole idea from the first two chapters. My husband, who's written seven books, said, you've got to put it all in the first two chapters, Rebecca. No one has time to read the whole thing. 
Um, but thinking with our rational minds, our official minds, is only part of the story. We need to bring our intuitive mind, our feeling mind, into the conversation. So that's what I want to talk about. That sounds like a lot, but since I've spent the last two, three years thinking about, like, well, how do you do that, and what does that mean, let me see if I can share that with you. So, let's start with an experiment. Please turn to the person next to you and introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Everybody needs a partner. Choose which one of you is going to speak first. Okay. First speaker, one minute. What's worrying you at the moment? Go. Other parts of the partnership, your turn. What's worrying you at the moment? One minute. Okay. Your minute is up. So now we're going to do the same thing again, same first speaker, but different question. The question is, what's exciting you at the moment? Go. Okay, second speaker. Second speaker, this is a good crowd. You could talk all morning, I can tell. Second speaker, one minute. What's exciting you at the moment? Okay, we're done. So I wish I could have listened to every conversation. But what I'd like you to do, please, is just for a moment, sit quietly, maybe close your eyes if you want, and think, how do I feel after doing that? How do I feel? What's going on inside me? Don't, don't get all kind of thinky, but you know, like, how do you feel? Feel kind of a mixture? Kind of a mixture? When you were talking about what worried you, there's a, I'm guessing for lots of people in this room, there's a lot of stuff that's worrying you. It's a tough time to be alive. We've got the election coming up. Those of you who have children, a lot of our kids are not feeling that great. A lot of them are worried about their futures. It's hard. Maybe we're going to have a bit of a recession. That's not fun. But when you talked about what excited you, there's good stuff happening, right? You can see. You can see light. You can see ways you can make a difference. You can see that the person you're talking to is pretty cool. <laughs> Do you get that feeling? I think too often we, we don't take time to like really talk about what's happening. It can make so much difference, even for a little bit of time. So that's one of the things I learned, is people are pretty cool, and they're doing some amazing stuff, and this is a hard time. So I want to talk about the two dominant narratives I'm not going to say of our time, which is far too grand. I'm going to say for people like us, people who care, who have some privilege and some chance to make a difference. I want to talk about the two dominant narratives we tend to walk around with. One is optimism. And this I call sort of the official narrative, the techno-optimism, and it's We've got this. It's going to be OK. And what's inside this narrative? Well, there's lots of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. We have the technology and the resources to hold warming to 1.7 degrees C. 
if we moved at scale hard for the next 10 years, we could do this. This is from a model uh, produced by the folks at MIT, a crack team run by one of my colleagues, one of my ex-colleagues, I was at MIT for 20 years, called En-ROADS. If you don't know it, I highly recommend it. Just put it into your browser. It will come right up. It tells you what we need to do in order to hold warming down. And you get to slide all these little sliders you can see. You get to slide them all over the place. And better than that, you get to see the underlying assumptions. And if you want, you can change with the assumptions. So um, pretty amazing. We could hold warming to 1.7 degrees. All we need to do is drastically reduce methane emissions, cut deforestation, introduce a carbon price, tax colon, and renewable uh, tax colon oil and nuclear, um, really accelerate building efficiency, invest in energy efficiency, but we can do it. Yay, okay, power. Yeah. We've already made fabulous progress. Coal in the UK, I'm British as you can probably hear, I grew up in England, there used to be a coal industry, it was central to the economy, it doesn't exist anymore. The price of renewables has dropped faster than anyone thought possible. I was a professor at MIT for 20 years teaching technical innovation. I did not believe renewables could be cheaper than coal. And now, in many parts of the world, renewables are cheaper than coal. This graph is not so great because it looks as though it's a lovely linear fall. This is an exponential scale. The price of solar has gone from about $100 a watt in 1975. I remember 1975. Down to um, under a dollar a watt. That is stunning. This is amazing progress. The price of batteries has fallen by 97%. Humans are amazing. Give us a technical problem and we can fix it. Renewables have surged. Huge deployment of renewables across the world when new power plants are built. I believe this is correct. We're building more renewable than coal and gas and oil. Fabulous progress. The share of electricity production from renewables 2022 surging across the world, not yet in New Hampshire, but in many places, you're seeing a majority of electric production, ele electricity production from renewables. This is stunning, absolutely stunning. Average per capita dioxide, um, carbon dioxide emissions worldwide are flatlining. We're finally not having to grow carbon emissions in order to grow the economy. Fantastic news. And the IRA, the Industrial Re Recovery Act, the largest piece of climate legislation ever passed. Some asked estimates suggest $3 trillion into renewables and into the decarbonization of the economy. It has completely changed the political conversation across the world. I was part of a conversation with the shadow uh, climate secretary in the UK and a number of other European politicians. This is a step up, a call to arms for every major economy. So fantastic, right? Yeah, we can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's do the other narrative. The other narrative is we are toast. You guys are on some kind of stuff. Of course we're not going to do this. Are you kidding? We can't do this. We are busting through planetary boundaries so fast you can hardly watch. And yeah, you're talking global warming, but let's talk about what's happening to biodiversity. Let's talk mass extinction, let's talk that the human race is pretty much set to be the equivalent of an asteroid. People are talking about 50% of all species going extinct. I don't know about you, but when I first moved to New Hampshire, it's not so long ago, my screens in summer were covered with insects. Did you see that? Now, it's just like a few. 
we're unraveling the fabric of the natural world and we have no idea what the consequences will be. The base case, that is what people think is really going to happen, unless we do something stunningly different, is 3.3. The good news is that's much better than it was 10 years ago. The base case, three point, uh, the base case 10 years ago was more like six, which was sort of crocodiles in the Antarctic, end of the speech, end of civilization. But 3.3 is not a good time. It is not a good time. This is a map, and I apologize, it's very hard to read from where you're sitting, but this is from a group called Probable Futures. If you don't know them, write it down. On the web, probablefutures.org, these maps are interactive, clickable, super interesting, beautiful explanation of the basics of climate change, but this is their map of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit at three degrees. And the colors, the dark red, is anywhere between six months to a year will be above 100 degrees C. The blue, which you'll see is a big chunk of the US, is anywhere between a week and a month above 100 degrees. And the green is between one to seven above 100, uh, above 100 degrees. So one of the things that none of our speakers this morning talked about is New Hampshire is going to be a climate refuge. There's going to be a lot of people heading north. So this is 100 degrees C. Let me show you something even, uh, even a little scarier. This is the likelihood of more than a year extreme drought. And the dark color is your likelihood of more than a year extreme drought is north of 70%. So those of you who have Spanish relatives, Spain is facing a situation where every year the odds of more than a year of extreme drought are greater than 70%. You'll notice much of, um, much of the world is facing very high odds of extreme drought. Again, notice that here in the Northeast, we're fortunate. We're less likely to have water problems, although the climate scientists I know say, you know, we just don't know, we just don't know. What we're looking at is massive climate variability. And last but not least, this is the fraction of days above 82 degrees wet bulb. Does anyone know what happens at 82 degrees wet bulb? Well, wet bulb means 100% humidity. It means you can't sweat. Does anyone know what happens to the human body at 82 degrees wet bulb? You die. If you spend any significant time outside, you die. The dark color are places in the world where there will be between, and the climate scientists tell me they just can't be precise on this, but anything between 30 days and a year of 82 degrees wet bulb. Look what's going to happen to India. We're going to see hundreds of millions of refugees this is scary stuff. <sighs> meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, we have a major political party in the most important um, democracy on the planet denying that this is an issue and actively fighting against it. And a dominant conversation that is like, yeah, something's happening, but like, it'll be fine. Large numbers of young people are losing hope. They're falling into fear and despair. We're not going to fix this. We're not going to do it. It's going to be awful. This is partly aggravated by some of the powers that be because fearful people, despairing people, stop acting.
They double down, they stay home, they cocoon, they run away. This despair narrative is super seductive and very dangerous. So, we need another narrative. The techno-optimism, don't worry, we've got this fixed, we've nailed it, is not going to carry weight. I can tell you it does not convince my students, except the really aggressive MBAs. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we can do this. Everyone else is like, guys, we're not going to pass the policies. It's not going to happen fast enough. Despair is useless and dangerous. We need a middle way. So what is the middle way? The middle way says major change is possible. This is not just a matter of getting the right policies at the edge. This is a huge social shift that we're talking about. A shift in which everyone is valued and the natural world is an essential part of who we are. We cannot make this transition without addressing the social justice issues as well. I could talk about why, I'm guessing you all have a good sense of it, but we, it cannot just be like, we're going to fix the climate, but good luck with your life. We have to be moving everyone to a sense of a better, juster, more sustainable world. A hundred years ago, women didn't have the vote. 30, I've got to get this exactly right, but something like 30, 40 years ago, the idea that I would be standing on this stage as a professor at Harvard, and I am, I'm going to boast, a university professor. There are only 25. It is the highest honor given to faculty at Harvard. Thank you. That's unthinkable in my mother's generation. Absolutely unthinkable. Massive social change. The idea that people with black and brown skins are actually people, that is a massive transformation. This is South Africa. Not perfect, not fixed, but oh my goodness, peaceful transition of power. Black and brown people are human too. These are fantastic social tran transitions. We can move as a society when we are motivated. And I read these massive moments of change as motivated by two things. One, yes, individual self-interest. Women did want to vote. Black and brown people wanted to be real people and part of the society. But also by a deep moral conviction that it was wrong, that what this change is, is a moral imperative and by a sense of collective by moving together, a sense that we can do something better. What the despair narrative tries to do is separate us each from each. Despair says grab what you can while you can. We need a narrative that says no, together we can do something different and better. We can still build a beautiful world. If I had more time, I would show you images of what's happening all over the world. Places where communities are turning back fossil fuel infrastructure. I would remind you that fossil fuels, fuel, fossil fuels cause millions of deaths every year. That a city in which power was clean would be a much nicer city, much easier to breathe. That we have the technology and the resources to ensure everyone has a decent life and, and, and food security and physical security. We can make this choice. This is the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. These are political choices. With the right political choices, we can still build an amazing world. It will be damaged, but it will be green, and it will be beautiful, and it will be in balance. So, how do we do this? I know, your business people got to get to the bottom line. So, how do we do this? Well, you already know how we do this. We reimagine capitalism. We think of firms as not money-making machines um, whose only focus is profit. 
we think of firms as amazing institutions that create jobs and prosperity and flourishing and make a real difference in their communities and, oh, by the way, need to make profits because if you don't, you're not in business anymore. We think of firms in which profit is a means to an end, not an end in itself. This is entirely legal. See the right pages in my book. <laughs> it is not uncommon historically. When firms were founded, they were founded as being in service to the community. That's why the charter was in, developed. That's the origin of limited liability. Firms were designed to do good things for the community in which they're embedded. So the idea that the goal of the firm should be to make money and also address public problems is not an old or crazy idea. Creating employment is the most important thing of many firms. Um, so this is not a radical socialistic idea. And it turns out that decarbonizing is potentially a huge opportunity. That there are at least five business models, ways in which you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and continue to make money. At Harvard, we have more than 300 cases describing firms managing through the green transition. Absolutely possible, lots of money. Is it easy? You know this. No. No major strategic transition is easy. It needs energy and attention and focus, but it can absolutely be done. And if I had more time, I would also take you through the models for treating employees with dignity and respect and paying them a decent wage. We have very good research suggesting that high road companies that treat their employees well are very significantly more creative, productive, and innovative than more conventional firms. So what are the models? You know this. The young people want to work for a company with a mission. When my son graduated from college a few years ago in engineering and computer science, I said, oh, I have connections. I can get you an interview at Microsoft or Google or Amazon. Um, no promises on the job, but I can get you the interview. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, do you not believe what you teach? And he went to work for a women-owned fintech in New York, empowering women around finance. This really matters. The kids really want to work. And you know, the kids vary in age. It's not just the kids. The 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds, they want to make a difference with their lives. Reduce risk. Ibadrola moved into renewable energy way before any other major utility company in Europe, with the exception of Enel. And when the European Regula Union introduced regulations, making it expensive to burn fossil fuels, Ibadrola's stock stayed firm. They knew there was a risk of regulatory change. They moved early. They reaped the benefits. Walmart, one of my favorite examples. My first visit to Bentonville, I came home and I was on fire, like, Walmart, change the world. And my son looked at me and said, I believe you because you're mom, my mom, but nobody else will. Um, Walmart is one of the leaders in this area. They took a billion dollars to the bottom line, straight profit, redesigning their fleet. Um, and they have taken more than 30% of their emissions down, making money all the way. They have, I think, Matt, you're not going to like this, I think their sustainability report is in the three, 400 page, <laughs> page region, but it's because they are pushing their supply chain, they're working with employees, they are showing it's possible to make money, and believe me, the margins at Walmart are so thin you can hardly see them. They wouldn't be doing this if they weren't making money. You can build your brand. Textiles is one of the most dangerous pollutant, um, forgive me, it's not that dangerous, but it's one of the most polluting, dirty industries on the planet. We're seeing increasing number of firms trying to differentiate themselves um, by, by being less dirty. Um, this is a firm, do you know them? They make uh, shoes out of recycled plastics. Uh, 
few years ago, they were bought at a thousand million dollar valuation. You can build entirely new businesses. This is SK, the second largest conglomerate in South Korea. Chemicals, the CEO says, we don't have a future in chemicals and fossil fuels. We've got to diversify. One of the biggest investors in batteries and other clean energy techniques. Coming to you soon, I know this doesn't go down well in, in the States, plant uh, plant-based meat. One of the things we have to do is stop eating beef. Um, I have a friend who recently a book, published a book called Half Earth Socialism. I'm sorry, he published a book, yeah, he published a book called Half Earth Socialism. He wanted to call it Vegan Communism. But his publisher told him you were never going to sell a book called Vegan Communism. But um, I'm afraid we have to stop eating meat and you're seeing plant-based foods going from $5 billion to $10 billion to now 15, growth rates of about 17% a year. Action by individual firms can make a significant difference. The research around social psychology, very clear. If you move, others will move. You demonstrate it can be done. You drive the technology down the learning curve. You change consumer tastes. You show them that there are new things and new ways to be. You change your employees' beliefs about what is possible. You make badly behaving firms not the norm, but you know, no, you can do it another way. You can do it another way. And you lay the foundations for smart regulation. Action by individual firms is, of course, not enough. But it is so important. It is catalytic. Why is it catalytic? It's catalytic because as you act as a firm, you learn that, whoa, have many of you in this room already learned this? It would be really helpful if everyone else in our industry moved in this direction. Anyone learned that? Yeah. Competition to make behaving well pre-competitive. Let's all decide to only buy sustainably grown palm oil. Let's all decide to raise farm-raised salmon in a way that is sustainable. Let's all decide Mission Possible Partnership is the steel and cement industries getting together and saying, we have to get carbon out of the production process. Let's all chip in. Let's make it possible. Um, um, Mining and metals, let's all decide to take human rights, rights seriously and uh, to, to move on pollution. These kinds of competitive partnerships are essential, particularly in a world without global governance. So s seeing this kind of cooperation is, is really important. Um, New metrics, also essential. I know this is something this room has talked about a lot. Notice I have taken the words ESG off the slide for obvious reasons. But that doesn't mean we don't need to measure the, the things we're trying to do. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it, you can't communicate it to your investors or your consumers or your employees. So yes, we need new metrics. And I could talk for a long time about this, but we need to rewire finance. Finance is so powerful. Did you know there's a room in which 15 people get together? And those 15 people control 35% of all the publicly traded assets in the world and a good chunk of all the other assets. They are gradually coming to believe that climate change might be bad for business that it's a systemic risk they cannot diversify away from. This quote is by a Japanese gentleman called Hiro Mizuna, who ran for a while the Japanese government pension fund, the largest pension fund in the world. They control more than 1% of almost every equity on the planet. And Hiro came to believe that if his fiduciary duty was to his pensioners, the biggest threat facing Japan was climate change. Japan turns out to be very vulnerable to climate change. 
And so trying to make a little extra percentage point by picking the right stocks was not the point. The point was trying to get the economy to decarbonize. And he was BlackRock's largest customer. BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. You remember at one stage, Larry Fink was saying, purpose is really important. We've got to address climate change. He's not saying it in public. He still believes it. I have a friend who runs one of the largest investment companies in the United States. He said that yes, the American investors are jumpy, that the political pressure is very real. The Asian investors and the European investors are all over this. Like we gotta get the carbon out. It's a threat to the security of the whole system. And he thinks, let's hope and pray we're in a purple state that there will be pressure from American investors soon too. Change is never easy. I spent the first 20 years of my career looking at systemic change. I spent six months in, Nokia, in Finland working with Nokia, trying to persuade them that Amazon was a real threat. <laughs> yeah, you giggle. They were, I, I, you laugh, I know why you laugh. They were shipping a million cell phones a week. They were two thirds of the Finnish stock exchange. They had a CEO, a, a headquarters built of wood and glass and steel that was so beautiful. And I remember meeting with the chief operating officer and the chief strategy officer and they looked at me and they said, we think you're probably right, Rebecca, but we can't do it, we can't shift. So I tell you this to cheer you up. Because sometimes I think, we think we can see what needs to happen so clearly, we get kind of imp impatient with the people around us. Are you ever tempted to think that the people who are not moving are stupid or evil? It's a temptation, isn't it? Sometimes it is. They are not. They are afraid. They have a different background. They're facing different pressures. I worked with a CEO once who was trying to change his firm. He brought everyone together and all the top managers, top 200, and he said, I've worked out the problem. The problem is you. <laughs> you are stupid. Now, I never use that word in a corporate context for two reasons. One, it's not true. Change is hard. Everybody fears it. And the secret to change is the excitement about what's on the other side. So the techno, we're going to fix it, it's just a few changes, don't worry, it's not a convincing narrative. We need a narrative about this is the fight of our lives. This is the most important thing you will ever do. You were born for this. This is the change. That's what we need. And firm after firm, I've seen that sense of purpose drive change. It's possible. It is absolutely possible. These are a few of our 300 cases. Um, this kind of change is possible. It's possible at the firm level. It's possible at the society level. We have no idea if it's possible at the global level, but we are going to find out. Purpose is critical. We are here not to make money. We are here to delight our customers and make a real difference in our consumer, to our consumers and our community. Each of these arrows represents academic studies about the link between purpose and shared vision, meaning and authenticity, identity and prosociality. The research is very strong. You have an authentic purpose, you are going to see improvements in trust, in shared vision, in, um, in intrinsic motivation. Does that mean you're going to be super profitable and off to the races? No, why? Because being authentically purpose-driven is expensive and time-consuming, am I right? I'm right, but it means you can survive. There is no reason to think that firms that care about these issues are less uh, financially successful. Lots of evidence to suggest they're much better at change much better at motivating people, and way more fun to work at. 
Reimagining capitalism also requires reimagining government. I'm so glad I followed on the speakers this morning, Sally, Doug, talking about how important it is for business to advocate for what they believe to be true. Because business alone cannot do it. We need supportive regulation, we need legislators that understand the importance of this transition on every level. Again, not just climate change, but social as well. So, you know, I love being a professor because I get to put up slides like this. All you need to do is <laughs> rebalance our institutions. So the free market is in balance with good government and civil society is in the middle, a healthy democracy, the rule of law, a free press, a voice for labor. That's all we need to do. This is the major achievement of the liberal West. This took hundreds of years to put in place. The idea that everybody votes, that government should be controlled by the people, that there should be a free market that is in balance with government, because notice you go too far on either end of this balance beam and it gets nasty. Right? A market run, a, an economy run only by the free market is, forgive me, a kleptocracy. It's Putin's Russia. A society run only by government, I don't want that either. I don't want Maoism, I don't want to live in China, I don't want a huge state bureaucracy. But this is the nature of being human. We're always struggling with this balance. So any of you with experience in Europe, Anyone here with ex business experience in Europe? A few? A little bit too much government, yeah? The states? A little bit too much free market. Look at life expectancy. Look at, yeah, healthcare. So we need that balance. So business can play a critical role in doing this. Tackling climate change requires controlling emissions, regulations and subsidies, all kinds of good things. So again, I love this, like, hey, they need to work together and be in harmony. I know how easy it is to say this, how hard it is to do. I strongly recommend you to a book called Fixing the Climate by my friends uh, Charles Sable and David Victor. It's wonderful. It's concrete case studies of business working with local communities and local governments to drive change on the ground. And I will make these slides available to everyone so you don't need to you know, take photographs or anything, but it's really worth reading. Okay, so in summary, purpose-driven businesses can have system-wide effects. Fabulous. You really can change the world. That's an incredible privilege. You could be dentists. Now, don't get me wrong, I have friends who are dentists. It's a fine and noble profession. But you know, you wake up every morning as a dentist and you think about what's happening and there's not that much you can do. You can vote, you can agitate, you can get organized, but you have power. I know it doesn't feel like very much power and life is tough, but that's part of the moment we're in. There's no hero who's going to come riding in on a horse. It's us, there isn't anyone else. This isn't going to be easy. Public trust in government is near historic lows. The official forecast, this is the uh, US Energy in Information Administration, um, is for fossil fuels to just keep going. That's our base case. But that doesn't mean it has to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. Even at 1.5 degrees, which is where we are now, we have trouble. We have trouble. These are days above 28 degrees, uh, 82 degrees wet bulb. India, South America, Australia, even the southern US. There's going to be enormous stress and strain. This is going to be a difficult moment. Um, we're not going to fix the climate, and there will be a great deal of suffering. But humans have never had it easy. I have a friend who's an Indian human rights activist, fantastic person. She said to me, oh, climate change, you're all over climate change, Rebecca. That's because you're white and privileged. 
And finally, taking all the resources for yourself and focusing only on consumption has come home to roost. Do you know the rest of us? We've been having problems for a long time. Humans were built for challenges. We finally are challenged. We had a dream that it was everyone was going to live happily and everyone was going to be able to eat, have anything they wanted, a Maserati in the garage, uh, you know, three houses. No, it's not going to be that way. But that doesn't mean we can't have a good life, a life full of friendship and meaningful work and challenge. So I only have five minutes. If I had more time, I'd ask how this all made you feel. How does it make you feel? Because I think that's a key part of what we need to do going forward. We need to learn to use both brain modes. Now, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy on you, OK? I was an MIT professor for 20 years. I have an MIT degree in engineering. So I am a nerd, OK? So a lot of neuroscience is consistent with the idea that our brain operates in two modes. Sometimes it's described as left brain and right brain, but that's not actually quite right with the science. It's more like a mode. So your left mode is good for narrow grasping work. So when they look at birds, birds activate the left mode when they're trying to pick up a tiny seed. You have to really focus in. That's all about fragmentation. Really, um, you love abstraction. It's confident. It, it's kind of all about me. Left mode is all about me. Grab that seed. It's competitive, and it's great with words. So, you know, college professors, we're big left mode people. So are business people. In fact, so is pretty much our entire civilization. The Enlightenment was a left mode event. Let's get scientific, let's get rational, let's get problem solving. Economics is a left mode discipline. Humans are selfish and focus on themselves. It's all about competition and status. That's all left mode. But there's a right mode. The right mode is when the, the bird is kind of looking around not just focused on the seed. The, the right mode is when the bird is looking for a mate or when you're in your family. That's your right mode. Your right mode sees the entire picture. Instead of abstraction and concepts, loves direct experience, loves um, dancing and music, focuses on the self in relationship, is much more cooperative. And I promise you, I'm not making this up. If you get a stroke that takes out one side of your brain, people who get their right mode switched off are obnoxious, focused, selfish people. You get your uh, left modes switched off, and your language isn't so great, but you're kind of radiating love. Super interesting. Now, I'm not saying we all have to kind of scoot over to that right mode. You know, let's just kind of do this and read poetry and have a good time. No. I have more than 25 years' experience on corporate boards, including 15 years on a Fortune 200. We can't lose that left side. It's really important. But we need that right side, too. We really need that right hand part of ourselves. So. I'd ask you to do this in the break. Spend a little time thinking about brings you joy, what brings you joy. Because the best way, the easiest way to motivate that other part of you is to practice joy, practice wonder, practice connection for this amazing world we're in. I, uh, I don't know about you, but do you ever think about like, wow, I just think, and my hand moves. Wow. Spring, you walk outside. It was all dirt and earth, 
But now there's this beautiful flower growing out of it. Now, I know I sound like I've left, lost my mind. So just for fun, let me remind you, degrees from MIT and Harvard, <laughs> a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the British Academy of Arts and Science. And I am telling you that I have come to the conclusion that we really need this. We need to rediscover what it is to be loving and connected. We need to rebuild our relationship to ourselves, to each other, and to the natural world. We could spend like a week talking about how to do that and what that looks like. I will tell you that I'm teaching a new course at Harvard which is trying to embody this. So we are doing the technical stuff and what the solutions are, and we're also talking about what would it like to be in community? What would it be like to allow your heart to be more open? Because I think that's what we need right now. So I have a bunch more stuff. Um, you know, it's all about cultivating your core self, finding friends or a community that will support you. It's, um, uh, I was going to tell you a story about my first husband, but I won't. <laughs> I was going to tell you that I think this crisis is a doorway into a much better world that we can no longer pretend that we're just separate individual entities, not deeply uh, dependent on each other and on the natural world. And that we can not fix things, but really make it better. Let me close with some quotes on hope. And uh, you'll see a bunch about my husband as we go through. He was a wonderful man. Lovely guy. So in conclusion, Mamedi's famous Ara Arabic philosopher said, hope is the belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Does that make sense? Do not get stuck in thinking about what's probably going to happen. What's probably going to happen is quite awful. What could happen is much, much better. Or Rebecca Solnit, hope is the ax you use to break down the door in an emergency. We're in an emergency. We need hope. And so this is by the great sage Rebecca Henderson. Hope is the choice we make for our children without being too attached to results. We are going to have to work and fight and never know if we made that difference. And we're going to have to teach our children to do the same. But it will be fun and it will be joyful. Thank you. Thank you for listening and for the work you do. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.